Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening and happy Halloween. Um, I am Devin Grayson Wallace of Peace Action Maine. And here tonight, uh, we have our program about the intersection of US militarism and uh, climate issues in our country and the world. Uh, the United States Pentagon is the world's largest single institutional consumer of petroleum, yet its emissions are excluded from climate negotiations. So this evening, um, here to discuss this grievous oversight, we are honored to have Janet Wheel of Veterans for Peace and David Swanson of World Beyond War join us this evening. Each will speak for about 15 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. And we ask you to put your questions into the chat and we will read them out to the group. Um, and uh, we will also invite you to unmute yourself if that flow seems to be working better at the end of the evening. Um, as a reminder, this is being both recorded and live streamed and we have muted everyone to prevent any background noise. And we're going to start our evening with Lisa Savage, who is going to remind us of what COP26 is. Many of you probably know Lisa Savage, but for anyone who doesn't, um, she founded the Maine Natural Guard and is very active on uh, all types of issues related to both militarism and climate. Thank you, Devin. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm going to be brief. Um, Peace Action Maine asked me if I'd contextualize tonight's remarks by two uh, people, David and Janet, both have been paying attention to this very important climate issue for a long time. And I'm really interested to hear what they're going to share with us tonight. I did want to remind uh, myself and everyone that we're on indigenous land. Um, I know that my neighbor uh, Barry Dana, past chief of the Penobscot, thinks it's ridiculous that people are flying to Glasgow for a climate conference because one of his big things is trying to convince everybody to stop flying and how bad that is for the planet. He and I often get in a little argument where I say, but Barry, it's really the military jets that are doing most of the polluting. He's like, but you know, here's what we can change. So COP26 is a coalition of the parties acronym, a gathering of uh, the nations and other organizations um, in the world to talk about setting meaningful climate goals. These uh, meetings often are referred to after the fact by the place where an agreement was reached, for instance, the Kyoto Protocols or the Paris Accord, where nations come together and say, well, we're not going to count our military emissions because that wouldn't be patriotic, but um, <clears throat> here are the goals that we're going to set for uh, reducing our admissions to keep climate chaos from spiraling out of control. It's kind of a see and be seen kind of event in uh, Glasgow. Uh, it's a chance for world leaders to kick the can further down the road about uh, meaningfully addressing their emissions. I know that Australia is up in arms because their prime minister is gonna come with a lot of smoke and mirrors goals and um, achievements that uh, people in Australia environmentalists feel are um, kind of written on thin air. The Pentagon will not be attending. Um, I know David said he was happy to hear that. Sure, why would the biggest institutional consumer of fossil fuels show up at a coalition of the parties? Um, luckily, there is a People's Summit for Climate Justice that's uh, concurrent with COP26 this year. It runs from November 7th to 10th. Um, many people are participating in that uh, virtually. I'm part of a group with Vets for Peace in the US, Vets for Peace in the UK, and the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space that will be doing a presentation uh, November 7th at 3 p.m. Eastern time about the climate impacts of militarism and also space programs, something we don't hear much about. So uh, that's all I was going to say about COP26. I'm really happy that you all are here this evening, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing from both of our presenters. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for that um, reminder and that introduction. That context is very appreciated. Um, Next, we will hear from Janet, who is from Portland, Oregon, which as everyone knows, has been having a particularly atrocious um, heat and rain, lack of rain, um, uncharacteristic weather. 
So uh, as a reminder, there is lots more information about each of our presenters on our website, but in the interest of being brief, I'm going to immediately give the floor to Janet and she can uh, introduce herself as she so chooses. Okay, thank you very much, Devin. Great to be virtually back in Maine, where Veterans for Peace started in the mid 80s. And I see some familiar faces, uh, including, of course, Lisa. That was a great um, setting the scene for us in terms of the very important climate negotiations that will be happening for the next two weeks. And some other folks that I know, also great to be here with David Swanson of World Beyond War. And yes, this is the sky blue scarf that World Beyond War uh, sells, and I'm delighted to wear it along with David. Um, I'm going to be presenting a short version of the 20 to 25 minute full uh, climate change and militarism slideshow that the National Project of Veterans for Peace has presented now to dozens of groups all over the country, including a few uh, months ago, Peace Action Maine. So I'm delighted to be back here again and look forward to an interesting discussion afterwards. Oh, sorry. I'm going to start with a couple of slides that, I'm sorry, um, that show the motivation which many of us share as we deal with both the climate crisis and US militarism and war. The executive director of Veterans for Peace, Garrett Reppenhagen, um, comes at this first as a father concerned about his child's future, which is a powerful motivation also for me and many others. I'll just give you a moment to read his words and then I'll say a bit more about the national project. The work of the Climate Crisis and Militarism National Project of Veterans for Peace is based on the fundamental purpose of Veterans for Peace to increase public awareness of the causes and costs of war. Militarism, and specifically US militarism, is one of the most serious and rapidly accelerating costs of war. Militarism fuels the climate crisis, as we will see in this presentation. And I think someone is not muted, so if I could ask please everyone else to mute. And here is the statement of a great grandfather, Woody Powell. He's a former Veterans for Peace president who worked for years on VFP's War and the Environment Working Group and is one of the originators of this project. The Climate Crisis and Militarism Project built on his work, and we appreciate his continuing service, including presenting the full slideshow recently to two groups in the St. Louis area where he lives. Veterans for Peace's Iraq Water Project and the Agent Orange Relief and Responsibility Campaign also relate to war caused environmental harms and long term consequences. And while our focus is on the climate crisis, we certainly are concerned also in this national project with other environmental issues. We're all familiar with the impacts of the climate crisis, and I know that the state of Maine has been hammered by terrible storms in recent years exacerbated by the climate crisis. I just want to review a few of the most um, you know, obvious points. Currently we're at 1.2 degrees centigrade global temperature rise, and we're already seeing worse um, impacts than have been provided or predicted rather by 
climate scientists computer modeling. The climate crisis has been called code red for humanity by UN Secretary General Guterres. And in the IPCC report released this August, it became clear that some trends are now irreversible, at least during the present time frame. Those include heat, <coughs> excuse me, heat domes, such as I experienced here in Portland, Oregon in June, hurricanes, wildfires, floods, beyond anything in the memory or experience of any of us, crop failures, such as the 60% failure of the Canadian wheat crop this summer, famines, and then the resulting displacement of populations, Arctic ice loss and sea level rise, of course, have been uh, talked about and shown for decades now. One of the worst famine impacts in the world this year uh, from climate, the impacts of climate crisis has been the famine in Madagascar. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Of course, there is no such thing as a green war. War and preparation for war are toxic in their every stage. What we see on the right is a photo of a burn pit, open air sites of solid waste incineration, both in war zones and in some military places, even in the United States. My nephew who is in the Marines now suffers lung damage from being exposed to burn pits in Afghanistan. These burn pits have been the subject of lawsuits by veterans and civilians. And of course, there are many, many other impacts, including um, depleted uranium, Agent Orange, and most catastrophically, beyond all other bombing, the so-called conventional bombs, the dropping of um, nuclear bombs and the testing of nuclear bombs, which just means that they're exploded. Here's a chart that probably a lot of you are familiar with. It came out three years ago, I believe, and um, it is based on estimates because of course the Pentagon does not uh, release in official reports its total carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. But the US military is at least number 47 among the 192 countries of the world in its greenhouse gas emissions. With the US finally ending the 20 years of war in Afghanistan, although we know there will be continuing drone strikes there, we are now seeing increased noise directed at China and Russia. On the left, you see war a photo of war games in the Pacific that involved US, British, and Australian navies. There are regular war gaming exercises with the militaries of South Korea and Japan to the fury of a lot of South Koreans and Japanese, I might add. The US and NATO run war games in North and Eastern Europe. And we see them in the photo on the right, uh, Arctic winter conditions war gaming in Norway. NATO has surrounded Russia with a ring of ballistic missiles in spite of promises to refrain from the, this kind of provocation. These so-called games or exercises use tremendous amounts of fuel and emit huge greenhouse gas emissions. The social cost of carbon is a relatively new concept and computer modeling tool. And this was first presented to the Climate Crisis and Militarism Group 
by the author and veteran Eric Edstrom uh, during our convention workshop in August. It's a way of calculating in dollars the impact of climate-caused um, catastrophes or problems. Military missions, even without a hot war, contribute to the long-term damage of the climate crisis. Those impacts include, as I've already mentioned, crop failures and other loss of agricultural productivity, human health impacts, property damage, and increased energy costs of all kinds. For most of us in this country still, we see these as inconveniences, but for others, it's the difference between life and death. This chart is from the National Priorities Project report, State of Insecurity, the cost of militarization since 9-11. Over $21 trillion, our tax dollars, have been poured out on this so-called war on terror, which is really a war of terror. Of the $21 trillion, here's how some of it's been spent. $16 trillion went to the U.S. military, including $7.2 trillion for military contractors. $3 trillion has gone thus far to veterans programs. $949 billion to Homeland Security and $732 billion to federal law enforcement, which is increasingly militarized. As we can see in this chart, which is a little out of date, but shows the um, relative spending, the United States spends as much on the military as the next 10 countries combined. So we can't just wring our hands about this. We have to take action. So we have made a lot of progress since this project began in August of 2020. We are currently working on the House resolution on counting and reducing military emissions, which Representative Barbara Lee is going to put forth this coming week. We have met with Climate Envoy Kerry's staff to discuss these issues and to push John Kerry, himself a veteran, to push Biden to start counting officially the military uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We presented our slideshow to many groups, and that's something that we'd like people's help with, getting this out to still more people. Um, and we have a pretty deep website, which I'll show you in a bit. So what can you do? Well, you're doing it right now, which is looking at a presentation that connects US militarism to the global climate crisis. And I thank you so much for being here. Use our tools and materials. We have a lot of resources for you on the website. Support the House resolution to count and reduce military emissions. And we can get into the details of that soon. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Peace Action Maine as one of 109 organizations throughout the country that signed on to uh, endorse this resolution. And now we're going to be asking individuals to pressure their own uh, members of Congress to support this House resolution. So we are stronger together and it's time that we have a serious results-based um, and not virtue signaling, frankly, um, peace and climate movement that is linked, uh, that different types of people coming at these issues from different perspectives talk and work together. And I'd like to close uh, this part of the presentation by 
reading a sentence from David's really useful book, War No More, The Case for Abolition. A world without war could be a world with many things we want and many things we don't dare dream of. And something that we want and desperately need is to have a world without accelerating climate crisis with all the horrors that it is already bringing and will bring in its wake. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. I, I guess I'm up. Uh, terrific uh, presentation, uh, Janet, and it's great to be here with this group and with Janet and with Lisa and with Martha. Uh, um, I, uh, I, I think Veterans for Peace is one of the best organizations going uh, on this planet. I'm, I'm proud to say I'm on the advisory board of it. Um, and I did want to speak uh, very briefly to this notion of being upset that the U.S. military is not attending the conference in Glasgow in person. I, I don't want ExxonMobil attending either. I don't want the top criminals uh, sitting in the judges' seats in courts either. I want government governments, for God's sake, uh, doing the will of people uh, and setting laws and applying them. I want militaries controlled by civilians as long as they must exist. Um, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to see if I can share screen as well uh, and go through a bit of a PowerPoint here. And I think uh, great minds think alike. I will try to jump over anything that's redundant in terms of what you've already heard. Um, I, I I, 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 well, let me let me start with with this. I, I think it's important to put into the context of U.S. and Western culture part of the reason why uh, militaries can be left out of climate agreements. Uh, you know, the, the fundamental reason is because they can get away with it until we cease allowing them to get away with it. The same reason they leave out international shipping or livestock or anything else they can get away with. But they can get away with it because people are in the habit of viewing militaries as sort of part of the wallpaper, the background, the, the natural world, and not not including them in obvious places where they ought to be included in things like budget discussions where in the US the top news story for the past several weeks is the most enormous legislative bills in the history of forever. And, and yet, of course, they're smaller in annual spending, dramatically smaller than annual military spending, which, you know, doesn't exist in the U.S. media. Uh, you know, the, the, the standards for uh, pandemic uh, control are, you know, military bases are just left out above the rule of law. Uh, Hollywood movies about horrors like uh, forever chemical pollution, the, the biggest contributor to which is militaries, the militaries are left out. Uh, the US Congress, most of whose members run for Congress without mentioning that 96% of humanity exists, much less, you know, treaties, wars, peace, uh, anything of the sort. So we have a problem with getting militaries to exist in normal conversation. Um, we have a petition set up, uh, Veterans for Peace and Peace Action Maine, and about 500 organizations and counting uh, have endorsed and about 25,000 individuals uh, have signed the petition at cop26.info and we're doing events uh, in Glasgow. Uh, and if you go to that website, you'll find links to more information and to all the events coming up both locally in Glasgow and elsewhere and globally uh, via the internet. Um, you heard a good deal about this already, but climate is only one bit of how militaries uh, destroy the natural environment, and, and greenhouse gas emissions is only part of how they destroy the climate. Um, but, and, and, and I think it's, it's worth noting the, the key fact, I think, about the, the burn pits that we heard about a minute ago uh, is the very credible uh, theory and extensive evidence that the current 
president of the United States had a son die of cancer as a result of, of burn pits uh, in US wars uh, and, and doesn't seem to have phased him in terms of his support for, for militarism. Um, but, but militarism uh, it is absolutely devastating uh, to the land, to the water, to the air of this planet, not only in the places where the wars happen, which are ruined and in many cases are ruined forever and left unusable by, by endless toxins and depleted uranium and landmines and cluster mines, but even in the places to, that are supposed to be benefiting from all of these distant foreign imperial wars where the, the United States military uh, is the source of the vast majority of the major environmental disaster sites in the United States and is a top polluter of the water and land and air in the United States, uh, and we're supposed to put up with this. And the places where US bases are imposed on the rest of the world abroad have no choice but to put up with it as long as those bases are there. They operate above the rule of law. They don't inform uh, or answer to the, the, the so-called host countries. Um, but when we look specifically at military greenhouse gas emissions, uh, it, it is absolutely huge, and, and I think it's worth restating, uh, though you've already heard it, that entire nation, about three quarters of the world, if you take each of those nations, three quarters of the nations of the world, if you take each of those nations, entire greenhouse gas emissions, military, civilian, and otherwise, it's less than just the US military's greenhouse gas emissions, just what we know of with the current state of reporting. Uh, so it's not, you know, it, it's, it doesn't dominate US greenhouse gas emissions, but it is on a global scale, major, incredibly significant, just the US military. And when you add the other militaries to it, it's even more. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I went on I went on Russia TV about two days ago. Uh, and you know, it's that, that this is a television network that will have on people who will criticize the U.S. government in the way that U.S. corporate television networks will not. But then the hosts and experts pay, you know, hired by Russia TV, they hire them from Fox and CNN. And, they, you know, they're spouting the same crap as as you get on the U.S. networks. And so they they did this story where they push all the glories of the new Tesla tanks and all the developments of the uh, of the military and U.S. capitalism that are going to save us. Uh, and, and it was absolute nonsense. I, I mean, the vast majority uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions from the military are in the air, you know, and they weren't they weren't modeling any future vehicles that leave the ground. Uh, and what they were suggesting was, you know, a future sort of dream. And uh, and, and it overlooked, among other things, the money problem, you know, we, we, we can't we can't go and rebuild the US military with with Tesla tanks, even if they had Tesla airplanes, we don't have the time or the money, we need the money for the problems we have no choice but to address, including the destruction of the climate. Um, so uh, looking at uh, looking at the, the the U.S. military with the EU and the U.K. next to it, this is from a friend who who studies the U.K. military uh, carbon emissions uh, in some detail, but occasionally throws in a graphic with the U.S. in it, and you see what it does to the it just dwarfs the whole topic uh, of of what the U.K. is, is doing. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, at worldbeyondwar.org, we've created a, a database of resources. If you click on resources or go to slash resources, uh, and you can put in a topic like environment and get a hundred and some resources, and you can click on a type of resource like articles or videos or comic books or children's books or reports or uh, videos or whatever. And so we've tried to put the very most useful things there, and you all can correct me after this meeting for in terms of what we've left out that ought to be there. Um, uh, this is, you know, I mentioned already one of the horrible ways that the U.S. military is is polluting the the water of the world is with these chemicals that they use unnecessarily to put out fires that they practice putting out fires. Uh, and uh, a, a friend of ours, Pat Elder, has has created a website, militarypoisons.org. Uh, if you want all the details you can imagine. 
Um, this is a nice fun fact I like to throw in here for the for the intersectionality, uh, as they call it. Uh, you know, the, 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 the heating of the earth is blowing up piles of weapons that are lying around on the earth. Um, you know, these two problems are interlocked in many, many, many ways, uh, but this is one new way. Um, I, you know, trying to, trying to break through this sort of magical force field that prevents most of the human species from knowing this problem exists at all, uh, I, I wrote a uh, Harry Potter story about uh, the secret of COP26 and the smoke belching train headed up to Glasgow for COP26 meeting. And uh, you can go read it at, at bit.ly slash COP26 Potter. Um, but I, I will give away the secret. The secret is they leave militaries out of the climate agreements. Um, the, the, the big problem I have uh, with this topic whenever it does get brought up, which is rare enough, uh, is that militaries are thought of as a sort of a solution rather than the problem. Um, you know, and, and, and this, is, this is growing uh, and the militarization of police in the United States, uh, in particular since the, the new Congress and the new president, uh, when local police departments say the word climate, boom, they get tons of, of military equipment from the federal government, uh, which of course they're not going to use in any way to address the climate. Uh, and we actually would benefit a great deal uh, from addressing fires and hurricanes and floods with unarmed people trained in, in expertise for addressing fires and hurricanes and floods. Uh, you know, one reason is that, you know, for many decades, the military has you, the US military has used natural disasters, uh, as they're called, as excuses to get into new territories and islands and never leave. You know, this is, this is my understanding of the US Navy's motto, a force for good. They're there for good. You know, they're, they're not leaving. They're not getting out. Uh, and, and the, the, the whole idea of the military as a solution or that we should just swoon in, in admiration because the military admits the problem exists. You know, it's just not good enough. The military is a major driver of the pollution itself, uh, wages wars to control the fossil fuels with which to pollute further, uh, threatens wars to go after territories that are opening up as the ice melts, props up, gives arms and training and funding and support uh, to facilitating coups and to propping up brutal governments uh, in, in significant part for control of fossil fuels. Uh, you know, and, and, and the military's reports and NATO's reports, uh, the, the, the recommendations that come out of these institutions, what they would be saying if they were in those meetings in Glasgow, armed or otherwise, uh, is very, very little about Tesla tanks, uh, which the military uh, has not exhibited any interest in yet. It's just a Tesla thing. Uh, it's, it, it's mostly about adapting which obviously we have no choice but to adapt. But if we're just adapting, we're gonna very soon reach a situation we can no longer adapt to. So we, it has to be about ceasing to exacerbate the problem. Uh, and there you got very little from the military, but you do get militarization of borders, treating the victims as the enemies. Uh, you know, This is where deferring to the military on these questions leads you. Um, and, and then of course, there's the other problem that we never mention uh, precisely because it wouldn't exist without militaries, uh, and that is the nuclear apocalypse, which has grown in likelihood, the risk of which has increased right alongside that of climate apocalypse. Uh, we just, you know, thank God we talk about one of them, uh, but we ought to talk about both. Um, and, and I know <laughs> we in this meeting all probably do, but uh, the larger we don't. Um, I uh, wanted to just show some numbers here. There, there was a 
you know, proposal from President Biden early this year for climate aid to foreign governments. Uh, and if you put it as a graphic on a on a chart with so-called military aid, that is weaponry uh, and and other economic aid, uh, you know, actual non-weapons aid, uh, it, it just, you know, it's just negligible. Uh, and, and if you put U.S. government climate spending, uh, even proposed huge progressive climate spending, next to fossil fuel subsidies, it doesn't measure up. So, you know, what sense does that make? And then if you throw military spending onto the same chart, you know, you, both of them become almost invisible. Um, and then uh, the, the goals, I, I should pull out the document I have on this if I'm going to talk about it, but the goals on the climate that President Biden proposed early this year for, you know, future decades uh, were just largely nonsensical and, and full of, you know, speculative future technologies and things left out and loopholes. Uh, but one of the key ones that's, that's left out even by climate groups, even by environmental organizations, is the one that we're trying to force into the discussion, and that is military climate destruction. Why in the world would you leave military climate destruction out of treaties to address climate destruction? Uh, I, I, I asked this of one uh, you know, advocate, uh, of the sort of change we're looking for. Uh, and, and his answer was, well, the nations are so busy dealing just with the civilian problems, they can't get around it, which completely evades the question, right, of why divide matters into civilian and military. We don't have two planets. We just got the one planet. Why separate militaries, give them a waiver at all? Why not put them in the same basket with the same laws as as every other sector. Um, things that can be done, um, I recommend everything you've already heard in terms of using the resources from Veterans for Peace. Uh, I also recommend, again, going to cop26.info uh, and looking at the links to uh, particular upcoming events in the People's Summit that are gonna be online. Uh, uh, resources for doing your own event on November 6th, uh, Saturday, week from Saturday, when uh, the, the big march is going to go through Glasgow. Um, look at info about the event we're doing on November 4th in downtown Glasgow on this topic, uh, and keep pushing for a demilitarized Green New Deal, uh, and keep working to build local peace and environment alliances uh, because the big environmental groups, uh, you know, most of them, the ones with any money, the ones you've heard of, uh, they won't touch peace uh, with a 10 foot pole, but the local ones love to, you know, everybody's local chapter of Sierra Club and every other group, more than happy uh, to build alliances and work for peace, just as peace activists are always happy to work for environmental causes. So if we build these alliances locally in enough places, we can influence the, the national and international organizations. Um, and, and I think this is the last slide I've got in here. I just wanted to throw this in as one tool, one sort of campaign that we do through World Beyond War and other allies. Um, we just posted an article a couple of days ago about Rotary Club, a huge global organization, uh, finally divesting from weapons. Uh, this, uh, this photo is from my town of Charlottesville, Virginia, where we passed uh, a resolution uh, to divest the city, the public budget, from both fossil fuel companies and weapons companies. And they had money in both and they divested it. Uh, it wasn't just, you know, to not invest in those horrible things in the future. Uh, and it was a very educational process uh, of, you know, presenting a resolution that made the connections between the two supposedly separate topics educated people in the process and, you know, and divested that those millions of dollars and did that little bit more to make profiting from war and profiting from environmental destruction 
into the shameful things they ought to be, the scandalous things they ought to be for anyone to, to get away with doing. It shouldn't be the norm. It shouldn't be acceptable and something rare and bizarre to demand divestment from them. Um, so, they're, they're, you know, work locally, work globally, and uh, to the extent possible and useful, uh, and it's wonderful that VFP has, has gone after John Kerry on this, work nationally, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Thanks for including me here. We could go into all the thing about John Kerry. Um, what he's saying is not adequate, to put it mildly, but I will be very interested to track his uh, statements throughout the COP. He's leading the delegation, even though Blinken, of course, and not Kerry is the Secretary of State. And thank you, the hashtags are helpful. I'm gonna drop a link in the chat to the page, Keeping Up with Climate on by Kerry, because he is actually a tiny bit more important than the Kardashians. One, uh, one person who's going to be there at the rally of activists uh, is Congresswoman Ilhan Omar and uh, World Beyond War and Roots Action and others have, have emailed everybody we know in Minnesota's fifth district. Uh, and I've emailed in particular VFP chapter 27 uh, and asked, can you guys make sure that Congresswoman Omar mentions militaries uh, in her, because she seems the most likely of the of the designated big speakers to be willing to. Uh, we'll see if she does. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for the fabulous conversation. Uh, we are rapidly approaching the time of night that some of us turn into a pumpkin. So I am going to um, leave you with a few reminders and invitations and close the question and answer session for the evening. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge our late friend and collaborator, Tina Malcolmson, who many of you probably know. I served on the Peace Action Maine board with her for years, and I know she was highly involved for many years before that in this community. Um, and, you know, so she would be delighted with all this information and the great conversation. I feel pretty confident this, this whole climate campaign is in her honor. Um, another reminder is that in November, members and friends of our Maine Peace community who took part in COP26 will be um, reporting back to share their personal experiences with us. And you can keep an eye out for details about that report back on our website, peaceactionmaine.org. Uh, while tonight's conversation centered on this honestly, truly spooky, disturbing issue appropriate to spooky season, fortunately, uh, this is one issue we can all come together to work on and help bring accountability for the United States military's contribution to the climate crisis, which leads me to the two actions I would like you to um, please consider taking. One is to sign the World Beyond War petition being delivered next week at COP26. I would say the most relevant thing right now is to please register for the online workshop with uh, which Lisa Savage uh, will be one of the uh, speakers. And that too is a way to get the message across without going to Glasgow, Scotland that you're watching and um, very concerned about what's going on there and learn more about the climate crisis and militarism. Thank you everyone for tuning in and being here with us on this Saturday night. And a particular thank you to our speakers, our local hero, Lisa Savage, Veterans for Peace presenter, Janet Wheel, and her collaborator behind the scenes today, Gary Butterfield, who was helping put in many helpful chats. Um, I mean, links into the chat. Uh, and, um, World Beyond War co-founder and executive director, David Swanson. Thank you also to all our local ally organizations who helped co-sponsored and put on this event. PeaceWorks, Greater Brunswick, Maine Natural Guard, Global Network, Space for Peace, Maine Veterans for Peace, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Maine. Please keep an eye on our website for other related events if you wanna learn more or get more involved as well as for those action items. And I hope everyone has a wonderful, warm evening and that their power stays on because I know it is storming here. So be well and take care, everyone. Great to connect. Thank you.